Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our International Women's Day seat at the table. We're just going to take a moment to let everyone get um, logged in, zoomed in, phoned in, however you're joining us today. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful. Well, today is International Women's Day. My name is Molly Gray, and I'm thrilled to host a special uh, panel discussion today as part of our Seat at the Table initiative, an initiative that we started uh, earlier this year to elevate the voices of you, Vermonters, working across our state, in our communities, in our businesses, in our nonprofits, uh, working to address some of the most critical issues facing our state. Today's focus is the economic well-being of Vermont women. And as I mentioned, today marks International Women's Day, a day globally where we recognize the achievements of women socially, culturally, politically, economically. But today felt really important to also recognize um, so much of what we have to do here in the state to close the gap for women in all of those areas. I think we can celebrate having a first female vice president, many women in elected office, but we still have a long ways to go. And to set the table for today's seat at the table, I wanna actually draw on some of the data that we know of. Uh, we know that in the month of November, 73% of unemployment claims were filed by women in Vermont. That is the highest percentage of filings by women in any state in the nation. We also know that of the 140,000 jobs uh, that were lost, I think it was in the January uh, national filing, 100% of those jobs were <clears throat> particularly Black and Latina women. So today we're going to dive into the data, the data that we have here in Vermont currently, the data that's still coming in around COVID-19 and the impact on women. And then we're going to dive into where do we go from here? We've got a lot of policymakers on the call. I see senators and representatives. I think Howard Dean, former governor, is also here today. Uh, welcome, governor. So let me begin by introducing our four panelists. First, Carrie Brown, the executive director of the Vermont Commission on Women, an independent, nonpartisan state government commission mandated to advance the rights and opportunities of women and girls in Vermont. Jessica Nordhaus is, serves as the executive director of Change the Story, a nonprofit initiative aimed at aligning policy, programming, and philanthropy to fast track women's economic status in Vermont. Susanna Davis, who was appointed in June 2018, I believe, to serve as the State of Vermont's Executive Director of Racial Equity. Susanna works with state agencies to identify and address systemic racial disparities and is leading the effort across Vermont to address diversity in government and in our communities. And finally, Meg Smith, Director of the Vermont Women's Fund, a community nonprofit leveraging philanthropy and grants to meet the immediate needs of women and girls across the state. So welcome to our speakers today. Today, we're, again, we're going to first focus on the data, and then we're going to dive into that data and what it means um, for marginalized communities, and particularly marginalized women in our state, BIPOC communities in particular. And then we're going to get into where do we go from here? How do we leverage public-private partnerships, policy making to address the urgent needs and the economic well-being of women? So to start us off, um, Carrie, we're going to begin with you. Tell us about the data. We know there's power in data, um, and data really captures oftentimes the experiences and anecdotes that we hear and live every single day. So Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. I'm really happy to be here. I'm so pleased to see so many people on this call who are interested in this topic and are paying attention to it. Um, as with so many other areas, COVID-19 is just exposing and exacerbating entrenched inequities that we have had as part of our system all along, but they're being made much worse and they're really being brought to light. So for instance, who it is who's doing the unpaid work of caring for home and family, uh, the reality of low wages and the low value of what we call essential jobs that are done by women, but don't pay very well. And the intersecting oppressions for women who are black, indigenous, or people of color. So the Lieutenant Governor spoke a little bit about some of the data about unemployment. Um, 
in in uh, it's true that in November, 73% of those filing unemployment in Vermont were women. It was actually even higher the month before that in October, it, which was a peak of 74%. We've been tracking this at the Vermont Commission on Women uh, since the pandemic began. And I'm gonna throw a lot of data at you and um, just letting you know that this and other data is available on our website if you wanna go back and, and look at it after I'm done. Um, it start, so that proportion of women to men is so much higher than nationally. Uh, it, it's about 50-50 right now, men and women nationally. And even that is out of character. That's not the norm. Typically you see more men who are unemployed than women. Um, so it's starting to get a little bit better in Vermont, but it's still um, nowhere near where it should be. And it's really strikingly much worse than it is um, in the rest of the country. And this doesn't count for women who have left the workforce completely. They don't get counted in the unemployment claims because they're not looking for work anymore. And there are so many more women than men doing that nationally. Um, it seems like about four times as many women as men have just left the workforce completely. They've just thrown in the towel and said, uh, "This is this is too much. I'm not I'm not doing it anymore." And those are gonna that's gonna have lifelong repercussions for those women and their families. It's gonna have it's already having huge impacts on our entire economy. And um, it's a it's a temporary situation, hopefully, uh, in some ways, but one that's going to have impacts for years and years into the future. And um, when we look at where those jobs are being lost, they are in areas like retail, food service, those kind of um, direct public serving jobs. That this is very different from a typical economic recession where we would see jobs that are more often held by men, such as in construction and manufacturing. Those are the ones that are more traditionally hurt. But in this pandemic, it's the ones it's it's the jobs that women have that are being lost, um, and women of color in particular losing jobs at nationally at a staggeringly higher rate than white women. So. Part of this is, as I mentioned, the kinds of jobs that women are doing. Um, it's also, as I mentioned before, about the increasing demands of unpaid caregiving, education responsibilities, and household labor. These are things that have always fallen disproportionately on the shoulders of women. They have always had an impact on the kinds of jobs that, that women are doing, the kinds of, the amount of time they have for the workforce, and the, the competition between the work and family responsibilities that um, for a lot of women, the, the work, the earning money outside the home tends to be on the losing side of things. And so the pandemic just really made that so much worse with childcare being closed, with schools being closed. Um, mothers reduced their working time by 50% more than fathers did when the pandemic hit. So it's not something that hit all parents equally by a long shot. Overall, women have reduced their working hours by four to five times as much as men have. And women are spending proportionally even more time now doing that unpaid labor at home, taking care of children, taking care of family members, um, help, helping with education activities, that kind of thing. So we're really seeing an, an unequal distribution there. And so the kinds of things this has an impact on are uh, obviously your ability to make a living and take care of your family. We are seeing this in Vermont with uh, uh, the increase in food insecurity so before COVID-19, one in 10 Vermonters were experiencing hunger or food insecurity. Now it's one in three Vermonters, 33% of Vermonters are experiencing food insecurity. And it's not equal across the board, of course. People of color are four times more likely to be food insecure than white Vermonters. Families who have young children are twice as likely than those who don't have children. And in keeping with the theme of the day, women are twice as likely as men in Vermont now to be suffering from food insecurity. There are also some health impacts that are disproportionately affecting women. Uh, women are much, much more likely to be in those front facing healthcare worker jobs like nurses, healthcare workers overall, 91% of the nurses in Vermont are women. And so it's not surprising that the rates of infection um, among healthcare workers are much higher. 77% of all the healthcare workers in Vermont who've tested positive are women. And then when we look at the people who are who are uh, getting COVID in Vermont, more of those who have pre-existing conditions are women, more of those who have neurological conditions and intellectual disabilities, more of those who are in long-term care settings, they're all women. 
So these are a few of the data points, a few of the ways that we can see that COVID is impacting women in Vermont. As I said, you can see a lot more on our website and I will turn it over to Jessica now to tell you a little bit more. Thank you. Jessica, over to you and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks so much for inviting us to be here. We, um, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, our data and Carrie touched on uh, a lot of the really salient points. One of the things Change the Story has been doing for the last six years is collecting and reporting on Vermont specific data. And there's a caveat there, which is that um, our data set in Vermont is somewhat fragile. Right? We are um, a small state already, and so it has been very difficult for us to tell the whole story or to represent everybody's experience or voice in that story. Um, I don't like the term statistically insignificant, but we do get into data sets that are small enough when we're looking at um, women of color, women living in rural areas, women living with disabilities, um, that we can't Ad accurately report on those statistics. Um, so in some of our work, we've, we've relied on national data. And I think Carrie pointed out, um, as, as did you, Lieutenant Governor, that you know, we, there are places where we are ahead um, or behind, depending on your perspective, the, the national curve. Um, our most recent report we, we put out in December 2019 called Women, Work, and Wages in Vermont. And it's interesting with the timing of that. We feel like that's gonna be some very good benchmark data for us as we start to learn more and more about the impacts of COVID. Um, the other work we've participated in more recently is uh, a, a survey that was launched by some economists at UMass Amherst trying to understand the impacts of COVID-19 on households and specifically on women. And that survey we just closed in the last month and we are on the very brink of having those results. So we should be able to report on the findings, um, the Vermont specific findings from that national survey uh, over the next month or so, which we're excited um, to learn about. So I think that, you know, Carrie touched on this, the, the jobs report, the job losses, those are, are really significant. Um, the kinds of work that women do, we know that occupational segregation is a big cause of the disparity in wealth um, between the genders and also between uh, women of color and, and white women or women of color and white men. Um, so the, the job losses are significant. And when you look at 5 million jobs lost in 2020 nationally, um, 5 million jobs, women lost a total of 5 million jobs. It's really a significant number. Um, and we're not gaining those jobs back as quickly. Um, and when you look at the occupational segregation that exists, um, the number of women in service occupations, which are the lowest, uh, is the lowest earning sector, um, they lost 18.8% of jobs in that sector nationally, whereas overall, the number of full-time workers who identify as women fell by 5.9%. So we're much more likely to see um, women of color working in those, in those jobs. Um, a lot of face-to-face, -face, those it entail a lot of face-to-face -face jobs. And then another interesting thing that we know about Vermont in particular is that over 80% of uh, tipped workers in Vermont identify as women, which is the highest proportion in the nation. And of course, uh, those, are, those jobs have been hardest hit. They tend to be um, hospitality sector jobs. Not, we're not just talking about wait staff and we're certainly not talking about high school students and a summer job. We're talking about people who rely on tips for their main source of income. Restaurant hotel workers, barbers and hairdressers, um, massage therapists and other personal service workers. So given our, our, our system that's in place now with a low minimum wage for tipped workers, those tips really become necessary. They're not considered supplemental income. 
And women are a disproportionate share uh, of all workers, of all Vermonters who are making under $11 an hour. It's also worth pointing out that a lot of those jobs um, include higher risk of exposure because they're not jobs that can be done remotely. Um, folks in restaurants, when they're eating, are not wearing masks. Their servers um, are, are at an increased risk of contracting COVID. And when we talk about the women in Vermont who are making under $11 an hour, the median age of that group of women is 38 years old. 28% of them have some post-secondary education. So either a college degree or some college. Um, and we know that national research indicates that tipping is often a discriminatory practice. So um, white service workers receive larger tips, for example, than, than black workers. Um, black women are also more likely to be uh, subject to sexual harassment in, in those positions. So I think I'll just finish up by talking a little bit about the gender wage gap. We hear a lot about that. Um, and it was a curiosity of mine when I was looking at the calculations of the, the wage gap this year, I was assuming that we were gonna see uh, a huge slip. When we're looking at women's participation in the workforce, we've fallen back to 1988 numbers. So we, we're, we're losing a generation's worth of ground. And yet our gender wage gap statistics are looking pretty good. They're looking better than they were. The caveat there is that the gender wage gap, the, the decrease in the gender wage gap has plateaued over the last decade. It's really sort of hovered um, right around 14 to 16 cents in Vermont. Um, and so it's easy to focus on that gender wage gap and feel like we are in fact, maybe not losing the ground um, that we are, but it's not the whole picture. So the um, International Women's Policy Research Group just released uh, an analysis on the weekly gender wage gap by race and ethnicity. And what that's showing is that the weekly gender wage gap has decreased, but that's because of disproportionate job losses. So it's it's not about women earning more in, in comparison to their male counterparts. Um, it's about uh, the huge disparity in job losses um, and the racial and gender wage gaps really do remain profound. So we see um, weekly earnings for Latinx women are just 58% of white non-Hispanic uh, men and um, black women's earnings are at 63% right now. So um, these, are, these are some of the issues that we want, we want to take a closer look at. And one of the, the reasons that Change of Story is working hard to um, develop ways to tell the story that aren't necessarily rooted in those numbers or be able to flesh out the numbers so that we have a better picture of what's going on. Thank you. And Jessica, you mentioned that the uh, most recent report that will look at COVID-19 data specifically, which I think will be really interesting to look at kind of the benchmark from 2019 and then today, uh, uh, when do you expect that coming out? And you know, by all accounts, what you and Carrie have shared paints a picture of a crisis, paints a picture of an economic crisis for women in Vermont, if I can read the tea leaves, but I'm just curious what we should expect and when we should expect that information. Yeah, it, it is absolutely a crisis. And um, we're hoping to have some, some findings and some cross cuts on that data in the next few weeks. So we're really interested in having that available um, to legislators this session. Thank you. We're working on it as fast as we can. <laughs> um, I'd next like to turn to Susanna Davis, uh, who through this pandemic has been really keeping an eye on and, and had our ear to what's happening in communities across the straight, state, uh, particularly with BIPOC Vermonters who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, Zuzana, could you talk about 
uh, how do we unpack this data or other data that's available to really get at the disproportionate impact on women of color that this pandemic has had and the economic trends we're seeing in the state? And then secondly, I am going to ask you um, from the state's perspective, you know, from your work, where do you think we go from here? And then we'll turn to Meg and then I'm going to come back to everyone to um, talk about the go forward. But Susanna, thank you again for joining us and uh, over to you. All right, when I started this, everybody, I'm Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director. Um, and, you know, there's so many important elements in the data that we just heard that have downstream impacts on the rest of our existence here. We heard a little bit so far about things like employment and promotional path, um, some of the other issues that directly impact um, women include things like housing. For example, we know that housing discrimination is a thing that happens in America. And of course, we know that it happens with people of color. I think a 2018 report by Vermont Legal Aid and the Human Rights Commission determined that in 44% of cases in Vermont, there was housing discrimination either against applicants of color or in favor of white applicants. That's here in the state, almost half, right? We also know that people who have children are often discriminated against in housing, particularly in rental housing. And of course, we know that I think as Carrie mentioned earlier, due to the disproportionate um, share of domestic and child rearing responsibilities that's placed on women, that usually means that those tenant applicants with children tend to be disproportionately women. We also heard from Carrie and Jessica about income gaps and wage gaps. And of course, that also translates into housing availability and housing vulnerability, because after all, how can you get a home loan? when your credit history and your income history have been scarred by being underrepresented and underpaid in the workforce. So not only does that limit your ability to secure housing and to reach home ownership, but it also means that that will determine where you can live. After all, can you purchase a home in Chittenden or Orange or Rutland or Essex County? That has a huge impact on where we live. And we know that where we live has further downstream impact. So housing is a big sector. Employment and promotional path, you heard a lot about equal pay and about the wage gap. And I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, there's so many ways that you can describe numbers. So I wanna um, provide an, an additional way that we can look at the wage gap. One thing that I always look at is equal pay day, particularly for different ethnic groups. So we know that women are comparatively underpaid compared to men, um, but what does that really translate into? And I wanna tell you a couple of dates this year, 2021, that are of importance here. So equal pay day is the date on which a woman would have needed to work to earn the same, statistically speaking, for the same work as what a man would have earned in the previous year. So theoretically, for calendar year 2020 in America, a woman equal pay day should be December 31st, 2020, which would mean that whatever a man earned from January 1 to December 31 for the same work should be roughly similar to what a woman should earn from January 1 to December 31. That's not the case. Women across the board are working into 2021 to catch up to what a man has made in calendar 2020. So for example, um, equal pay day for all women in America is March 24th, which is about 16 days from today. So a woman in America, statistically speaking, would have needed to work 16 days from now to earn, starting from January 1, 2020, to earn what a man earns January 1 to December 31 of last year. So that's about three, almost four extra months. But that doesn't tell us the whole story because that's for all women in America. Let's break that down a little bit. Equal pay day for Asian American and Pacific Islander women in America is March 9, that's tomorrow. Equal pay day for black women in America is August 3rd. Equal pay day for indigenous women in America is September 8th. So we're starting the next school year before you've earned the same as a man in the previous calendar year. And finally, equal pay day for Latina women in America is October 21st. So using myself as an example, I will need to work until the end of October, until basically Halloween to earn what a similarly situated man would have earned in January 1 of last year if we'd both started working the same day. So when we think about uh, breaking down disparities by sex and gender, 
it's not only important to look at it on that scale, but also to dig deeper to understand disparities within the gender and sex categories. Uh, other sectors that are related to this include MWBE, minority and women-owned business enterprises. Oftentimes, a lot of institutions and local jurisdictions have certain contracting goals. They might say, we want to give X number or X percentage of our contracts to minority and women-owned businesses. But it's easy to fill that requirement if you're doing all your business with white women-owned businesses. In that way, you're able to say that you've satisfied your diversity goals without actually being racially diverse. Um, we also need to talk about language access and about all of the opportunities that we're providing to people, whether they're small business owners or housing, rental applicants, or what have you, are we being linguistically accessible? We have a large immigrant population, a large resettled refugee population. Are we making sure that everything that we offer to the public is being offered on equal playing field? And I'm just gonna take, talk a tiny bit about the interconnectedness of all these sectors. We talked a little bit earlier about where we live and how that impacts downstream effects. For example, uh, where you live, determines whether you have access to fresh or healthy food. I was shocked to hear that statistic that you said earlier about um, food insecurity, the one in three Vermonters, because coming from you know lower New York, my first thought was, but this is where we grow the food. And, and so thinking about food insecurity, where we live has such a big impact on whether we are food secure. And our access to fresh and healthy food impacts our academic performance, our work performance, our downstream health impact, which drives healthcare costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also have to consider what protections are we having, not only for, for women, women identified people, but also for men who may be vulnerable in the same household. For example, we have a large undocumented population of people. Many of the agricultural workers in our state happen to be undocumented and also happen to be men. Without appropriate protections for that population, we're also endangering all of the women and families who are here with those people who may have to um, head up the rear or um, pick up any slack that's a result of that lack of protections for that population. And finally, when we're thinking about long-term policy impact, long-term has to include today's youth because that is the long-term, that is the future. And so we have to make sure that our equity programs are not only aimed at women identified people or at um, different racial groups, but equally important that they're aimed at youth making sure that youth initiatives are giving young people more of a voice and more of a say in helping to determine their own futures. Uh, particularly because in Vermont, people of color tend to skew younger. The average age, the median age in Vermont is about 47, but that's mostly true for white Vermonters and indigenous Vermonters. All other Vermonters of color have median ages in the 20s, which tells us that it's the young people in our state who are more racially and ethnically diverse. And therefore, when we think about equity, um, it's got to include a youth perspective. Thank you, Susanna. Um, you know, it's hard when we have so much data today and there's so much information being shared. Um, we're gonna try to package all of this up, reshare it. Everything will be shared on YouTube as well, just so we can unpack so much of the advice that we're, we're capturing today, the experience. Um, and I wanna come back to some of the downstream impacts, Susanna, that you mentioned. But before doing that, Meg, I wanna turn it to you. And I know we will be talking about the state's perspective um, and some work that Susanna has been doing. We've been talking about the data, but there is another piece of the picture and that's the work of nonprofits that have been on the ground over the last year, um, working to leverage existing grants and funds to meet immediate needs. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you've heard from the Women's Fund, what you've been doing and sort of what you also see as the way forward in terms of um, necessary economic investments. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, even though it seems at this moment very depressing subject. But um, I think we can shed some positive light on it. I do want to just say that, uh, you know, for those who don't know about the Vermont Women's Fund, we were started 27 years ago by women who were very disgruntled and fed up that there was no actual uh, funding for programs to serve women and girls, or it was very limited, or it was not being uh, taken seriously. And that was the sort of foundation of why this fund was started. And with philanthropy, um, women's philanthropy, it was only because of the funding from the Women's Fund and with our partner organizations of the Commission on Women and Vermont Works for Women, that the Change the Story reports were able to um, be created. There was no data uh, for 
over a decade on women's economic status. So the, the role of philanthropy in Vermont has been very, and women's philanthropy is very, very important. Um, today, talking about COVID and, and the nonprofits that have had to work under extreme duress, whether it's domestic abuse shelters, having to um, switch gears and deliver services to uh, victims of rape uh, over the phone from the hospital, uh, things that uh, I, I can't even imagine to helping um, isolated families um, get services that they need for, for their very basic needs. The nonprofit community um, and service organizations have done an incredible job in our state. And uh, the Women's Fund, but the Vermont Community Foundation and many other uh, funders and foundations have really done their very best to try and get funds out to these organizations because they're really the, the um, social safety net that we have in our state. Um, however, those statistics about hunger tell us that, and food insecurity, that, that there is so much more to be done. Uh, the fact that we have such significant job loss uh, by women in the hospitality sector uh, specifically is enormous. And what is going to happen to those women, um, you know, six months from now, a year from now, we don't know. And we want them to be able to get jobs again, but also have a wage that is livable and that has can feed their families and take care of, of their families' basic needs. So, and the number of single parents, the households in this, in this state has risen dramatically over the last 20 years. So we have a kind of a whole new paradigm that we're dealing with. However, I, I have great faith and I've seen firsthand how people have responded. Um, the Vermont Community Foundation's COVID-19 Relief Fund raised $10 million and has gotten, I believe, um, maybe almost 8 million out the door and is continuing to. Uh, there, there's every private funder and foundation I have talked to talks about giving out money um, just for general operating support, not putting um, any restrictions on it. So I would say the nonprofit community has a very um, strong network to rely on, but funding is, is of course, always going to be an issue. And so philanthropy has a very important role right now. I don't want to take up any more time, but I'm, I'm really happy to answer questions or talk about this further. I, I, I love hearing from all our presenters here um, and, and Susanna in particular, really representing um, people and statistics that we had not known about two years ago. So we have a new landscape that we're dealing with. And as as um, perhaps discouraging as, as it might be on the surface, it's really actually giving us a much clearer picture and uh, a more accurate landscape and framework for us to move forward. Thank you, Meg. And I wanna pivot, pivot to the go forward or moving forward, um, which we really try to do as part of these gatherings, these seat at the table events, uh, specifically because we have policymakers here and a lot of folks who are working on the ground. We really wanna capture some of that expertise. So what I'd like to do next is maybe go back to each of our panelists. And if there are you know, two or three immediate things you'd like to see happen now um, to sort of put those out and we'll do you know, quick, you know, quick fire of each of the different ideas. Um, I also want to ask anyone who's listening, if you have a question, a thought, um, please feel free to, to type into the chat or raise your hand. We're going to next move to Q&A. We want to make sure that when we get to as many questions as we can. So before um, going back to our speakers, I do want to capture what's happening uh, nationally for a moment. Over the weekend, the Senate passed the American Rescue Plan, a $1.9 trillion rescue plan. The House is expected uh, to take that up. Vermont is expected, if nothing changes, to receive, I believe, about $1.3 billion in relief funds. That's an incredible amount of money for our small state, and we're very, very fortunate to have the congressional delegation that fights as hard as it does. But we have a moment to think really strategically, not only about how we get relief money out the door, 
um, with this next uh, amount of funding, but also how do we recover stronger? There's legislation that's already been introduced here in Vermont in the House and the Senate on child care, uh, paid family and medical leave, on addressing the, the tax on menstrual products, for example. And there's a lot of work that's underway. Nationally, we also have the Family Act, you know, a potential plan for a paid family leave program. So there's a lot out there. I think the moment is right, right in many ways um, to, to act. And today is also about a day of action. So with that, I'd like to go back to our speakers. And if there you know, are a few things that you think um, policymakers need to do, or we need to do as a state, um, and, and that goes for our congressional delegation as well, we want to hear from you and elevate your voices. So Carrie, I'm going to come back to you. Where do we go from here? What do you do? What do we do? What would you like to see happen? Great. Well, of course, there's a long list of things that uh, could be done right away and that um, would help a lot. And you touched on some of them in your remarks just now. The COVID relief money that's coming from the federal government is uh, provides Vermont with an opportunity to think strategically about how to use that money to benefit working families um, and working parents in particular. So I am I would encourage policymakers to be thinking about how to target those funds where they can, where they have that flexibility uh, to help get parents uh, caught back up, get out of the holes that they're in and get back to work. Um, and that's obviously gonna impact more women than men, but it will impact working fathers as well, which is really key. Childcare is the other thing that you mentioned. I know that the legislature is working hard on this right now, but um, it's the 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 help that the, our childcare system needs is profound and dramatic. Um, to be to have affordable, accessible, quality childcare that's available to families, and also that compensates the people who are providing the childcare at uh, levels that are uh, that allow them to support their own families. Um, Right now, child care providers are some of the absolute lowest paid employees in our entire economy. And it is some of the, I think everyone now is recognizing finally that it's some of the most important work. It always has been, it will continue to be. It's um, important to children and families. It's important to the very function of our entire economy. Um, similar to the unpaid labor that women are doing so much more of in the home than men are, our entire economy is reliant on the caregiving, both paid and unpaid, that is uh, that is happening and that we can see right now with COVID is so essential. So I would encourage thinking about um, both both sides of that child care coin. And then paid family medical leave is another one um, that you mentioned. There are a number of bills in the state legislature right now, one that would provide a publicly administered universal social insurance program that would allow for paid family and medical leave to everybody who works in Vermont. Um, we also have another one that would expand the number of people who are currently qualified to take unpaid time off to care for themselves or a family member um, and would increase the expand the definition of family member in there. And then there's another bill that would require employers to provide dedicated sick leave. Um, so it wouldn't be enough just to say you've got some paid time off and you can use it however you want, but there would have to be some that was specifically reserved for sick leave so people were able to take care of themselves and their family when they got sick. So those are a few of the things. Um, my, my colleagues have lots more suggestions. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Jessica, over to you. What do we do? Um, well, first of all, we encourage the state of Vermont to continue uh, collecting and disaggregating data by, by race and by gender um, so that we can, we have more tools to use to understand um, what, what's happening and then to also report on that data we collect. We don't want it to, to sit on the shelf. Um, and that will help us do apply an equity lens to all of our policy decisions, to our budgeting. Um, there are there are folks who are advocating for gender based budgeting, race race based budgeting, so that you're really making sure that the the folks who have been made most marginalized are included in activities um, of government. We know that employers have a huge impact and can have an immediate uh, effect on the people who work for them, which, which includes the families of the people who work for them and um, their community. And so um, when we see this, the state has in the past focused a lot of relief funding on businesses, it's really important that um, 
that some of those funds are, are going to help businesses support childcare for their employees and care responsibilities in general. We, we really do have a high childcare need, but there are a lot of folks who have respons care responsibilities for other kin, other people in their families and their communities. And we need to keep that in mind. Um, flex the ability to be flex flexible or have a predictable and reliable schedule is also really important, especially um, to working mothers who are still predominantly the ones who are organizing um, child care and care responsibilities in heterosexual families. Um, and then I'll give you a little teaser of some of what we're hearing from the UMass survey. Uh, we had over 500 respondents who are Vermonters, 89% of those were women. And imp it's important to also mention that um, the vast majority of the folks who responded to this survey earn between $100,000 and $150,000 a year as household income. So um, we're not necessarily getting feedback from folks who are struggling economically. Um, but the five things, the top five things that were named that would help right now are uh, stimulus, another stimulus payment, one-time stimulus payment, greater mental health supports, 32% of respondents reported having had a panic attack in the month prior to taking the survey, uh, better access to internet and technology, deferred student loans, and more support with childcare and education. So we know that's what Vermonters are asking for uh, right now. Small, small ticket items, <laughs> no, but I, in all seriousness, I think that's incredibly helpful and we really look forward to seeing that report once it comes out. Um, I think budgeting is a you know, huge question, right? I think the, the, the question that always comes up is how are you going to pay for it? Well, this is a moment where we really get to align our budget with our greatest needs. And the data allows us to have numbers backing up the need, which is so, so critical. So thank you again for sharing that today. Um, Susanna, I wanna come back to you. I know you shared some thoughts uh, previously, but what do you see? Where, what can we do either with the stimulus funds, um, or policy initiatives, actions that we can take before the legislative session ends or in the months, weeks, uh, year ahead? Yeah, I'm just gonna say we should do what Carrie has said and Jeff has said and what Meg's about to say and do it with an equity lens. So my contribution here is gonna be do all of those things and more. However, it should be done with an equity lens. And what that means is Implementing policy, having given thorough and adequate consideration to all of the people who may be impacted. Remember earlier, we talked about um, disparities by sex and gender, but then when you break that down by racial groups, you find further disparities. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about things like affirmative action, which when people think about affirmative action, we tend to think about, you know, like 20 something black male athletes in college, but we, what the data actually show us is that the number one beneficiary group of affirmative action policies in education and employment is white women. So what I, I say all that to say that when we create policy that we do so with a full understanding of who's gonna receive the benefits, who's gonna receive the burdens, are those being equitably distributed and are they advancing our goals or perpetuating the current status quo? That's extremely important and um... Susanna, can you talk briefly, I'm sorry to, to keep you on the hot seat, but about any of the tools that are coming out, if there's a, a place for employers to look to or administration officials or others to sort of on like how to do that work daily um, in setting up a policy or implementing a program. Formalize it, make it second nature. And for it to be second nature, it has to be a regular habit, right? So one of the things that we do at the state is, um, I, think, I think at the end of last year, perhaps we rolled this out where now we conduct what's called an EIA, an equity impact assessment, which is exactly what I described. It's a set of questions that we ask ourselves to ensure that we're having equitable balance of benefits and burdens of policy proposals. These are now required with any budget or policy proposal that comes out of the executive branch. So the next time that we pr propose a budget augment or cut, we will have asked ourselves those questions. Is it gonna have regional disparity? Is it gonna affect a particular racial group or religious group? Um, just as one example, if we had done that with, I don't know, Tobacco 21 legislation, then you wouldn't have Abenaki people who are indigenous 
unable to participate in sacred rituals involving a sacred plant, tobacco, um, simply because that law did not carve out a religious exemption for possession um, for people under 21. If we had conducted an EIA during that process, we likely would have discovered that and not had a disparate racial impact for Vermont Abenaki population. So the EIA is one really important way. It's used in many jurisdictions across the country, so it's sound policy. And it's one important way that we can make asking ourselves these questions second nature. Thank you. And Meg, over to you. There are two areas that we're really focusing on right now. Um, child care being one can, and I think everyone has, Carrie particularly really outlined, not the dual side of child care. It's, and it's not just taking care of our children, it's paying child care providers uh, a, an equitable wage. And by equitable meaning, they should not be the lowest paid workers um, in our in our workforce. Uh, but the other area that we have, because of the data that we did six years ago and updated in 2019, we know that women's business ownership and entrepreneurship is an untapped resource and that women with not a whole lot of extra support can um, really be economic drivers for, for Vermont in this recovery. Uh, we have more women starting businesses. This is again, pre-COVID, more women than men starting businesses and the revenues that they make are abysmal, 19 cents to the dollar that a man makes. Part of that is not having the um, technical assistance or the wherewithal of to how to build your business. But uh, we have many, many solopreneurs in this state all doing wonderful work and coming up with great ideas, but never hiring an employee. And if one out of every four business women owned businesses hired one employee, that would add 5,000 jobs. And that's, that's a really low threshold. Um, we, the, and the number one barrier to, um, for most women in business to grow their business is lack of access to capital. Um, women traditionally, I've heard from a banker, women do not like to take out loans. Uh, women don't want to go into debt. They don't know. So that is a, a barrier. That's one of many, but that's sort of a psychological barrier. Um, but also they're turned down. Uh, by financial institutions or venture capital groups. So when you look into the data, it's something like 3% of VC dollars go to women. Um, that's very, very low. So we look at the Women's Fund has been looking at, at women's business ownership as this untapped resource. And to that end, we are actually creating um, a database, an online database, so we can actually track the number of women-owned businesses in the state, which at currently does not exist. And we're, we will be rolling that out later on in the year, but that was one of the um, mechanisms we see as a way to help foster business ownership by women. And um, all of this, and, and, then, and then the last thing that we as an organization internally are doing is trying to really look at our grant making. Um, and this goes to Zuzana's point about our equity lens and how we address as a funder, how we look at our philanthropy and dismantle perhaps our own barriers and also try and get, get funds um, in a different way in participatory grant making style. So there's sort of an internal thing that we're going through, but also externally trying to look at, at areas where perhaps policymakers uh, can't move as quickly um, and, and, and others. So, and I'm always open to new ideas, but those are the childcare and business ownership are really important building blocks to our future and our immediate future, not two years down the road. Thanks for that um, important update on some of the things that you're doing. I think the, the database on women-owned businesses, we don't, I believe we don't have that currently in the Secretary of State's office or BIPOC-owned businesses in Vermont, which doesn't allow us as investors, as purchasers, as employees, 
um, to fully understand the nature of economic activity in the state and where we can um, participate and provide support. We have a lot of questions in the chat and I'm gonna to try to pull um, three of them given that we've got about eight minutes left and uh, give them to the panel. You, you can decide sort of whether you wanna to touch on um, each of that or not. I think the first question was on women who have been in long-term care facilities providing care um, really at the forefront of COVID over the last year and then leaving at the end of the day and coming home to take care of family. We have seen an incredible amount of stress as women on women as nurses, as care providers, and also in many cases providing care to um, you know, loved ones who are in facilities who can't connect with family. So sort of how do we coming out of this pandemic support uh, that community. Also teachers, um, teachers as we know who have been on the forefront, right, navigating online learning, navigating um, this hybrid classroom model. Um, vaccines you know, starting today for educators and early childhood care providers, but this is a workforce that is really there at the brunt. Um, and what kind of support, that, you know, can we provide what lessons learned again? I think we have a lot of them here today. And then the final question, uh, for the panel um, is on workforce development. Uh, there's a question about the women who have had to leave the workforce. And we know in the state we have a shrinking workforce. We really struggle to re recruit and retain employees. How do we make sure that women re-entering the workforce um, are able to access training, uh, courses, um, to be able to re-enter and re-qualify in some areas? So, Three different areas, three sort of general questions. And Carrie, I might start with you. Feel free to answer whatever you want. We'll go through. Um, and if you want to include maybe a, a last word in your um, response, that would be great. Uh, and that's, again, just thank you everyone for all of your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. Sure, thanks. Um, so just a kind of a general response to, to what I heard in most of those questions. Uh, I, I just have to reiterate again that the kinds of support that women need, the kinds of challenges that women are facing as they're you know, working in long-term care facilities or their teachers or child care employees where they're working really hard and then they're coming home and caring for their own families. Um, these are things that are, that are worse during COVID, but we're always bad. We're always a problem. We have always been asking too much of our caregivers. So to, to ask them to, to do this work professionally for very low pay and very low professional standing, and then to, to ask them to be doing the home care at, for their own families as well. It has always been unsustainable. And so the, the great opportunity that we have now is for, um, it just being impossible to deny that anymore. And so if we can provide mental health supports, if we can provide livable wages, if we can provide um, a quality access to healthcare, to childcare, and as well as workforce development, now in response to what's going on with COVID and keep those in place, then we will actually fulfill that that hope and that dream of coming out of a pandemic better than we went into it. We really have that possibility within our hands if we take that approach. And I'll, I'll call that my, my final word. <laughs> Jessica? Thanks, I, I appreciate Carrie's pivot to the opportunity um, because we really do have a, a fairly impressive opportunity here, I think, to change some um, deep, lasting systemic inequities and to really look at our systems and be very intentional uh, in how we engage. And you know, we can't say it enough, applying that equity lens um, from all different dimensions of diversity is, is really critical. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna address the last question about workforce training. We do know that um, gender specific cohorts really work for women. And so our partner Vermont Works for Women who is part of the, the Change the Story partnership along with the Women's Fund and the Women's Commission um, has done decades worth of work um, on supporting uh, female identified folks, um, women and girls and um, gender non-conforming people to do just that, to overcome the barriers 
um, that a lot of those folks face in getting into the workforce, in transitioning out of incarceration, um, in training and special skills in higher paying fields. Um, so they, they have a lot of expertise in that and a lot of good information. Um, you can find out more about that on their website um, and some of the programs that they're running right now. And I think uh, it's worth the state taking a look at how we're doing workforce development and whether we can apply uh, a, a specific equity lens to, the, to those training programs. And then I'm really personally very interested in the conversations that are happening around universal basic incomes. Um, and I think that, you know, to be able to empower people to make decisions about meeting their own needs is really important. And it lifts a lot of the, the burden and the weight about deciding, are you going to pay your rent or are you going to um, you know, who in your family is going to eat, or are you going to help uh, buy the medication that your, your parents need? Um, so I think that, that could go a long way for us in, in really stepping forward as Vermonters and, and making sure that all Vermonters are taken care of. Absolutely. Uh, Susanna, over to you. Yeah, I think a big part about this is process equity and how do we uh, implement good policy going forward that not only is the right solution, but that we arrive at that solution in the right way. And that really means pulling, the com pulling in the community and having them direct the work. And I saw one question that asked specifically about this, how do we incorporate more voices of people of color in this work? And so much of what we have to do really re requires us to trust marginalized people enough to shape their futures. And that means youth, and that means women, and that means people who speak languages other than English, and it means people who don't normally have a direct line to government. I often find in equity-based conversations that I'm in a room with the same 12 people who are always invited to the same hearings and who are always featured in reports and commissions. Um, but there are more than 40,000 of us in Vermont who all have things to say. So I suppose what I would leave with is um, that all of our work should have process equity built into it, which means we've got to hear directly from people, be less prescriptive in telling them this is what we think is best for you based on our history of always being in power and often leaving you invisible. And instead pivot to what do you need to make you whole? And, and then we do that. It, it, it's smart, it's simple, and it's inclusive in a way that people, um, people have, have agency. And not because we give them agency, because that's not something to be given, but it's just something that we can stop denying folks. Thank you. And Meg, over to you for a final closing comment. And I know I, I packaged a lot of questions there together, but any final thoughts? Um, um, I, of course, I always have a final thought. Uh, and, and this may ring, sound like shameless promotion, but it's actually, uh, philanthropy has, for women, has been a game changer in Vermont. The Women's Fund has been a catalyst for a lot of solid work, including the Change the Story initiative, our partner initiative um, came out of philanthropy. And this online database is another example of creating, filling a need that sometimes people don't even know is a need. Um, and it often with, when you look at policy and you look at change, it often needs that, that catalyst, that agent to, to push things forward. And philanthropy is that catalyst. So, uh, but, it is not to preclude the work that we are all doing together. It is to just help move it forward faster than it might on another track. And it won't happen without all the tremendous minds and thinking that uh, from the panelists here and all of you to make it happen. So it's just a stepping stone. And um, so that would be my, my recommendation. And thank you, Molly, for pulling us all together on this. It's been a great, great um, learning experience for me, as it always is. Absolutely. And I regret that we're now at 1230. I feel like we literally just scratched the surface. There's so much data. There's so many incredible people on this call. I'm just scrolling through the 
a list of over 100, I think 111 participants. I want to thank you for joining joining us today. I hope this is just the first conversation. We have new data coming out. As Jessica mentioned, there's a lot of existing data on the Commission on Women's website. Uh, Susanna is working tirelessly right now, and we also need our nonprofits to continue to be able to do their work. So please leave today. Think about what we've discussed, but stay engaged, stay involved, stay in touch with my office, stay in touch with policymakers, reach out to our congressional delegation and make sure they get the Family Act passed. We have a federal paid family leave program. Um, get involved in any way you can, but please stay connected. We have to act. We have to act now um, to address the economic well-being of Vermont women and the crisis that we face. So thank you. Happy International Women's Day and greatly appreciate you joining us today. And with that, I'll ask you to give a round of applause to our panelists um, and please stay in touch. <laughs>